Welcome to the Extraordinary Achievers. My name is Wayne Peters, and today we have Heron on the show from Empower Change. Welcome, Heron. Hi, Wayne. Thanks no, for having me. Thank you. And nice to have you here today. I'm glad to be here. To empower and change our viewers. <laughs> well, let's see what we can do. Yeah, fantastic. Let's roll on. So, tell us about Heron. Who is Heron? Where did Heron come from to um, be able to empower and change? I guess we'd like to hear about your childhood first. Mm -hmm. I guess, uh, in terms of childhood, I guess, you know, I'm from, I'm from Bangladesh. Um, we, I came here when I was young. Mm -hmm. came here to actually join our father. Uh, he's been here over 60 years now. Um, thing is, I guess, with the, with the childhood, mm -hmm. I mean, I, you, know, I, um, you know, one of the stories I would want to share and I think you know if you look at uh, how my life has been, it's obviously it's always almost always goes back to childhood and experiences that we've had. Like all of us, yeah. they say that, that. I remember listening to something once that said that that little child in you manifests in itself in some way um, as you grow older, yes. and that's where you you really get your strength from. Yes. And so I myself one day look back and I thought. Hmm, I wonder what is in my childhood and I wonder who was my idol in, mm. when I was a child. And then I looked at my dress sense, it was my sister Heather. Mm. I always used to think, oh my gosh, she looks like she just stepped out of a dynasty. <laughs> 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 then I looked at my big hair that I always have and then I thought, mm. ooh, Dolly Parton, Tina Turner. <laughs> and um, so yeah, so please tell yeah, us, definitely, so definitely. what was that little boy saying when you were... No, it was a lonely boy. Yeah. That's the thing, I guess. It's, it's a lonely boy. It's like it's um, an experience. Can you imagine mm -hmm. coming into the UK, or a new country, new place, at the age of eleven, mm -hmm. not having had gone through uh, any education, formal education, so you haven't gone through you know, the nursery, the primary, um, and you don't even know a single letter of English. Mm -hmm. and, and now you're in the middle of England. And you're in the middle of England, mm -hmm. where you don't know no one. You, you, don't, you don't know anyone. You um, you don't even know the in a language of ABC mm -hmm. in the U, in the being in the UK. Yeah. And um, you know, daunting as it sounds, mm -hmm. you know, having to go straight into um, secondary school, and that has certainly built me. Yeah, well, I can I mean, imagine. So you get into secondary school, fresh from Bangladesh. Yep. And you can't speak English. Nope. And now you're in a secondary school, not primary school, secondary in school. In secondary school, preparing others yeah. and myself are preparing for GCSEs, yeah. which I don't even know what, what, what that meant at the time, obviously. So how did you, how did you get on? Oh, goodness. I remember a, you know, one, of the, one of the reasons why sometimes you, re, you know, when I'm recalling back mm -hmm. and thinking about what is it that actually made me mm -hmm. you know, learn the language and what is it that actually made me, uh, you know, during that time actually say, yes, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, a one of my teachers, Miss Andrew, I remember very well, the English mm -hmm. teacher. Um, she there was a setup in the class where we had to do a um, we had to do basically a role play. Mm -hmm. On a, uh, so everyone is taking a part in a play, the book that we had to read. Yes. And uh, Miss Andrew goes, Heron, you know you have to take a part. And I say, uh, but Miss, I don't know how to read. I don't know how to do. That. I'm, please, not not me. Mm -hmm. And she goes, no, 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 you have to try. And I, I, and I said to her, okay, I, said, I agree, I have to agree. So she's obviously insisting on it. Mm -hmm. And then as, others, as all the young people were going through, all the kids were going through their parts, mm -hmm. I came to mine, and I must have pronounced the word wrong. And every, the whole class just start, started laughing out. Burst out into laughter. I, I just, everyone's burst out in laughter. I then basically got up and started crying and walked out of the whole class. Mm. My teacher follows me, Ms. Andrew comes out and says, look, Karen, the fact that you tried, that's good, that's good enough. enough, okay. Yeah. On that day, I think that, that's a, like a pivotal moment for me in a sense, of mm -hmm. how and why I, you know, I decided to do what I did. Yeah. I then said to my, um, myself, I said, look, those kids in that room, mm -hmm. I will beat them, as in, I will be better than them. That's right. You know, at their own language and everything. Mm -hmm. At the GCSEs. Mm -hmm then even the ones who were born and brought up here and, and studied here. I'm going to do better than them. I'm going to do better. <laughs> no one loves at me. That's it. And that's it. I'm not going to have another person laughing at me. Yeah. yeah. Within a short space of time, you know, I went to various different things. I didn't have any support. Mm -hmm. The father couldn't speak English much either. Mum couldn't either. I didn't have any other, you know, my brother or no one was there. Mm -hmm. I had to literally read the billboards as I'm walking down, trying to make sense of the words. Yeah. 
I would listen to the radio. I would go through um, knocking on neighbors' doors to see if they can help me with the homework. Oh, wow. So all of those things. And then you had the situation of... Um, then, in terms of GCSEs and mm-hmm. obviously the exams and everything, slowly, slowly, as I picked up, within, within six months or so, I picked up English. Wow. <laughs> and within the next few years, I got... I was like, myself, I was shocked as well. Even though I made that decision and, and set out to do what I'm, I was but about to do. But you surprised yourself because you I, exceeded your own expectation. My goodness, I was yeah. thinking to myself, I've got nine GCSEs, A to C grades for someone who didn't even know a single letter of English. Yeah. So I thought, if that's possible, then what's not possible? Anything. There's nothing that is in, in impossible. That's right. And then every time I would go and do something, and this is, this is the thing, so it's one of those things that definitely resonates with me mm-hmm. as to what has made me be who I am today. Yeah. But you also now, then, so you succeeded, passed all your examinations, and everyone once again could speak English very fluently, and mm-hmm. you are sailing through. Then with all the confidence in this world and with all the education you have, you started off your own businesses. Right. But then you failed. Yep. Yep. Before you could get back up again. <laughs> yep. You ha- it's, 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 this is the thing. I mean, I guess, I mean, I studied um, law and psychology, mm-hmm. a degree. Mm-hmm. And I, one of the things, when you want to do something, yeah. before I started business, so in terms of why did I start business? Mm-hmm. So if you look at... Um, I said to myself, I'm going to study law and psychology. And yeah. you always start with these ideals, high ideals. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to do justice. I'm going to you know, uh, get, you know, get free the uh, people who are oppressed and things like this. Mm-hmm. All of these ideals you start off with. Yeah. And yeah. as first year, second year, as I'm doing more and more studies in the career path I was choosing to do, mm-hmm. which was obviously to be a barrister. That's right. I then, second year, I thought, hold on a minute here. What I think, what I believe, what I know, mm-hmm. okay, what we know, whether I, if, I, if I think you're guilty of something, I cannot be the judge of that person. And even if I, you may have done something completely wrong, you could have raped, you could have done this, you could have done that. Mm-hmm. But I'm not the one to be judging. And I have to protect you, mm-hmm. as in I have to do my job. That's right. And who am I to my intuitions? You know, I cannot be the judge just based on my intuition. Mm-hmm. So if I can free you based on evidence, technical grounds and things like this, mm-hmm. I would have to do that. That's my job. Mm-hmm. And then you're clearly not going to say to me, yeah, I'm guilty. <laughs> That's right. So I thought to myself, I couldn't sleep with myself. I could not sleep knowing that I've done something, that I've freed someone, done something like this, which I feel deep down that is in this person guilty. Mm-hmm. I then... That's when I decided I'm going to complete the degree, fine, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to go into pursuing my career. Yeah. And then that's when I decided to, to open an estate agency. Yeah. And in terms of doing the research and everything like that, and based and then set up my own, own place as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But a story I want to share with you actually here is this very very funny thing. Mm-hmm. When I first came to you know when I when I first um, started my secondary school, yes. going back to that moment for a moment, yeah, lots of people bullied, cast, mm-hmm. you know, said so many words that I didn't even know the meaning of. <laughs> so can you imagine? I remember you telling me the yeah. story that the children will be swearing at you and you had no idea thank you were just saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so at least now we can look back and laugh at it. <laughs> I said to myself, I had, I had a delayed reaction. Mm. It took me six months later, I actually understood what they were saying. That so they were swearing at me and you, you were just saying You were actually you. swearing at me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like that, you know. I couldn't believe myself that it took me six months to realize that when they were, what they were saying to me mm-hmm. was actually swear words and not being kind to me or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just one of those moments in life, you remember. But those are the moments that strengthen you when you look back because yeah. you drew that strength from there and then you went on not only to pass your GCSEs in English, but you went on to become a barrister. Yeah. And then you and went on to open up your own businesses. So tell us a little bit more about this day agent. You know, when I decided... Um, I always think about why am I, what am I, where is my place? Mm-hmm. What do I want to do? You know, when I thought about what do I want to do? Where, where is my place? What is it that I enjoy doing? Mm-hmm. I thought to myself, okay. I then went on a journey before I even started the, in the business actually. I went on a journey of searching for what is it that I fit into best. Mm-hmm. So I went into different careers. Mm-hmm. I worked with um, Santander yeah. in terms of Abbey at the time. That's right. I uh, worked for a year to see if I actually am, if I'm a banker, if I want to be a banker or not. Mm-hmm. And then went into working in an IT firm, mm-hmm. you know, looking at in terms of how software side, sales side and hardware side and all those things. I said, 
Okay, is this me? No. But you're good at that. I'm, I'm good at that, <laughs> but it's not. It's just not deep down. Somehow, it's not me. It's not you. Then I went into, um, and then I worked with an agency. I thought, okay, I like the idea of sales agency because I don't like being confined in an office. I don't like behind, being behind a desk. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, hold on a minute here. So if I don't like that, then state agency is good because I can be in an office. Mm -hmm. I can also be out of the office. That's right. And I can also demand the kind of money that I want mm -hmm. because it's based on commission, based on results. That's right. All that. I said, okay, so this is the kind of field that I want to do. And I like customer service. I like meeting different people. Yeah. I thought, okay, then I, I don't have any experience in that, so what do I do? So I then went on to um, look for jobs. I, my research started um, looking for the job and everything, going into that field. Now, a gentleman who actually um, owned a company in West Norwood, mm -hmm. I went to have an interview with him. And on that interview, um, he said to me, he said to me, how, how, you know, how, how, how you been? Like, you know, you've been it's getting here, was it difficult? I said, no, 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 I actually came here yesterday, um, came down here just to make sure that I you know, I know where I am, so I'm not late. Mm -hmm. And then he said, okay. So he took me to the interview room, and then we went to the interviews. And then he basically, gave, you know, at the end of it, I, I told him that right there and then, by the way, when I'm joining you, mm -hmm. I'm actually joining you on the basis that a year later down the line, I'll be setting my own place up, yeah. but I want you to know that from now. <laughs> I'm only here to learn. You know, I'm here to learn and everything. But, but I'll learn with passion. That's it. That's I'll give it. you my best, but I'm ready to go. That's it. <laughs> Fantastic. I then said to him, look, uh, so I will be doing that, but I will not be taking a single client of yours. Mm -hmm. I'll not be based around anywhere around here either. Mm -hmm. But if you're happy with this, then offer me the job. Otherwise, don't worry about it. Yeah. And then he, he actually did. He, he said, yep, fine. He offered me the job. Fantastic. I said, he goes to me, do you know when I actually gave you the job, by the way? Mm -hmm. Do you know at what point I gave you the job? I said, no. At what point? He goes to me, when you walked in, when you came and, and I asked you, how were you getting here? Was it difficult and things like this? And you said to me, you came the day before to find the place. To me, that showed you know, a lot. Yeah. And actually I gave you that job at that time. I thought, okay, so preparation nice. is key. That's it. <laughs> so this thing. So, and then throughout this sort of times of you know, going through different different researching things, doing things, mm -hmm. um, I found I went through lots of personal development trainings. You know, Tony Robbins mm -hmm. uh, training where yeah. did you um, walk on the call? That's it. Walked. I couldn't. That's the thing. I thought to myself, how can, you know? Like they obviously <laughs> you've been prepared over a three day period mm -hmm. to walk over hot burning coil, mm -hmm. and I actually done that. Wow. And I thought to myself, hold on, if that's possible, if I can do that, then what's not possible again? Anything is possible and nothing is impossible. That's it. So <laughs> each time, so it's, like a, it's like a, hold on it here, I'm, I'm going through this, t learning these techniques, personal development ideas, mm -hmm. and all of these things, I'm going through the experiences in life. Why are these things that I'm learning not being taught to the young people? Yeah. So this is sort of fast forwarding a lot now. Yeah. But in terms of, so these were like times and moments when I thought, okay, hold on, these are good, these are useful, this is good, this is good, this is good. But I can't see this being taught anywhere else. Yeah. So in terms of, the, that's, that's the sort of journey there. But if you look at um, the state agency and that, you know, from scratch, I kept my word a year later. Mm -hmm. um, I went on to East London, I went actually, I was in West Norwood where he set up. I went to East London, far at the other end. Yeah. I didn't have a single good client there. Um, I didn't take anything from him. Mm -hmm. Started from scratch. I started a company called Capital Dwellings, mm -hmm. um, and which I ran for four years, and then I sold the business, yeah. and then I basically um, then went into employment. But this, this is the thing here. This is the thing. I wasn't being true to myself when I was running that business. Yeah. And one of the things I shared with you before was that why did I sell the business then? Yes. If you were doing so well, why would you sell it? Yeah. I thought to myself, my priorities wasn't correct at the time. That's right. And I thought to myself, hold on me here. At the age of 11, when I came here, I didn't have any support, I didn't have mm -hmm. no one. Mm -hmm. and, and I was desperately looking and searching and for someone, and someone to actually support me and all that. Yes. Now, I have two children, mm -hmm. I have two sons. And I thought to myself, I'm, within those four years of me being successful, making money and doing the deals, mm -hmm. working 24-7 you know, more or less, I was missing the vital time of my son's lives yeah. for four years. I thought, what is more important, 
when they're 18, 19, 20 years of age, when they don't need their daddy anymore, but they've got a Lamborghini <laughs> to, to ride, yeah. but then ultimately deep down they're going to say, well, you know, dad, we didn't, we didn't want this. Yeah. We wanted you, you when we needed you. That's right. So I thought to myself, hold on, okay, then my priority is not right here. Mm -hmm. I can always go back into business, but I can never get their time back. Yes. And that's when I actually decided that I want to sell the business. So I can focus on my, you know, my son's life. Yeah, that's right. And then from there onward, that's um, that's when um, so I, I sold the business and I, I moved on. Worked in a, 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 as a manager at uh, Carphone Warehouse. Mm -hmm. Worked with them for a few years. Focused on my, you know, my son's life. Now they're at a stage where they are a lot, lot better, yeah. more stronger, mm -hmm. more older. Mm -hmm. Hopefully wiser. That's right. Um, <laughs> like their dad. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I don't know about that. But um, yeah, so. So now at, the, at least there, now I can venture into the things I want to do. That's right. And that's one right. of the things is um, I always passionately, even though when I was working in from Warehouse, yes. I was finding myself actually delivering personal development training to the young people that were there yeah. or as my consultants. I was giving up my Sundays, for example, uh, where I was not get, being paid for it. <laughs> and I was being there for hours and hours on end. I would actually sit down and go through personal development training with a group of young people there. Yeah. I have a friend, um, her name is Paula Harris German, and she says that in 89% of whatever she learned was from volunteering. So it's, it's key. Wherever your future is directed to, it's all about volunteering yeah. so that you can get that experience. It's experience that you cannot buy. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. I and mean, this is the thing. So, I mean, I guess, same here. Volunteering is, is I, I believe, that's a key as well. Yes. Because you don't know it's actually one of the vital ways of actually learning as well. Mm -hmm. But when you're volunteering, you're actually getting um, so much more knowledge and everything that someone's already been through. That's right. And they put a system in place, so you're getting the opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and obviously if you utilize yourself. Right. And this is where I actually volunteered as well. So I volunteered um, once I decided that um, last November, actually a year and a half ago now, mm -hmm. I decided that uh, I might retail days, retail management days are over. I don't want to be in that field. Mm -hmm. I then resigned from Carphone Warehouse. I always wanted to actually do that anyway. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, this is the time. Yeah, as you're getting older, you're not getting any younger. You know, pursue your passion rather than a job. That's right. In that sense. So I resigned. I then uh, volunteered mm -hmm. with a, a, a organization uh, that was running a project in Southwark mm -hmm. uh, called Ether Risk. Um, and with an organization called, yeah, called uh, Stand Up Sadak, it's Cambridge House, which mm -hmm. is in Sadak as well. So they were running a joint project um, for called Stand Up uh, Cambridge House, mm -hmm. Youth at Risk. They were running a joint project called Stand Up Sadak, and they actually advertised for volunteers. Mm -hmm. So I, I looked it up. I actually said, I would like to be a life coach. I'd like to be one of your volunteers. Um, they took me on. Mm -hmm. And then during that phase, they were running a six month program but they were doing a monthly pro program. Okay. So as they were doing monthly program, the young people that were part of it, the gap between one month to the next is too big a gap That's for them right. to actually to continue the being whole, engaged, in being engaged with it. Yeah. So they said they needed a personal development program yeah. to tie them over within that month period. And I said, look, I've actually got something here which I would like to you know, offer to you yeah. uh, as an organization and uh, as a pilot run. Okay, and I put together over a ten-year period, mm -hmm. which I've, I've which I've done. They agreed. Uh, they agreed, and they have showed them what I what I would do, mm -hmm. um, and everything. Um, they liked it. They said, "Please go ahead and all that." Mm -hmm. So week in week out, I I was running this program every Thursday for two hours with, yeah. you know, um, eight to ten to twelve young people mm -hmm. at a time, and uh, over a six-month period. The young people that started off or six months ago mm -hmm. were not the same people that are six months later. <laughs> Fantastic. And I bet that was more fulfilling than in any job that you'd ever been up to that point, right? Because Very you much. could see yourself playing a role in the community. Mm. You could see yourself actually empowering and changing others. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hence, I mean, in terms of the actual name, I thought to myself, hold on, why, is it, why, why would I want to be called, sort of, why would I want the organization to be called Empower Change? Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, there are lots of organizations that will do, they will tell you what to do, mm -hmm. and they will, you know, they will hold your hand and they will take you there, mm -hmm. and they'll make you drink the water and things like this. Yeah. 
But, you know, I, you know if you look at that um, quote, actually, or the phrase that goes, if you catch a fish mm-hmm. and you put that on, on someone's plate, you only feed them for a day. But if you teach them how to catch the fish, then you feed them for life. That's right. So in terms of what I wanted to do was to actually have a system, a setup, a, a program mm-hmm. that would give them the tools so that they no longer need heroin anymore. They no longer need the power change, in a sense, yeah. to hold their hand throughout their lives. Right. The tools is what's going to hold their hands to, you know, and, and then, then they will themselves recognize the changes that they want to see. Mm-hmm. So throughout uh, my life, all the things I've learned in terms of the old techniques and strategies and ideas, mm-hmm. I've diluted it. Put it, to, put it together in a program yes. and use that as a catalyst for the change to, uh, to obviously for the, for, with the young people. Mm-hmm. And uh, in terms of um, looking at that, it's the tools that actually does the job rather than you know, an individual. Yeah. So this is the way, it's like I can't be in two places at the same time, but I may want to run two projects. That's right. So if you have a tool that does the work, then you don't no longer have to be there. So what I have access to is like what I call empowerment coaches. Mm-hmm. So there'll be empowerment coaches that will be part of Empower Change. Yes. That will then be delivering some of the actual material. Because you're going out to schools now, yeah. to youth clubs, and you're reaching out even for the mothers that are out there. Yeah. And the youth of them are, because we have our youth right now that have not much to do out there. Mm. So you're there now delivering something that you're saying, okay, I've got a stop gap. They go to school, they watch TV, they play a little bit of football, but there's something here that we can give to the children, we can give to the youth, we can empower them, yes. and we're empowering them, they can change in their daily routines, because it's sort of a life management class that you yeah. offer, isn't it, to the yeah. youth, which is fantastic. So, Heron, if someone wants to be part of this group, how mm-hmm. do they contact you? They can contact me through the um, obviously directly through on the mobiles, mm-hmm. or they can also contact me through the. Uh, they can go through the website. Sure. They can be part of the, our Facebook group and things like that. Okay. So in terms of the the website and the, I guess direct contact and the website contract are the two main ones mm-hmm. that um, they can you know, go through. Yeah. Uh, but if you look at um, really, you know, we are looking at people to be part of it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's like you know running the program that I run with. Youth at Risk and uh, uh, Cambridge House. Yeah. That's one. They also run another program with Lewisham College mm-hmm. as well, and that will be an ongoing one as well. That's right. And there'll be various other ones that we'll be looking at running as well. Yeah. And it's also fair to say that, although we won't mention where and when, <laughs> <laughs> it's also fair to say that um, your work has actually been recognised internationally. I and mean, there are other countries outside, besides the UK, that mm. are actually wanting to adopt this into their schools and colleges. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, strange how life happens <laughs> because, you know, you never think that you want to start something small like that and then it gets catapulted into an international so many, scene in the sense where people want to, be, want to be part of it. Okay. Um, a good friend of mine, actually, who's an Iranian friend, mm-hmm. um, who is looking at taking this to Iran. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at, I mean, I was, like, I was you know, very, very like, surprised okay. in a sense. I mean, even uh, what's more even surprising was the few young people that I did run the six-month program with. Mm-hmm. There was 50 of us who were volunteers. Yeah. And then when they, after six months later, they chose me to nominate me for an award. That's right. We were coming to the award because you're an award well, winner 2014. <laughs> like, with more to come, obviously. <laughs> more to come. But, that, more to come. <laughs> but the thing about it here yeah. is that you know, you never think, you know, like when you set up your journey, yes. you never think that, you know, you're going for the award and like that. You yes. always think that you just want to do the job. You just want to do the, what's needed to be done, mm-hmm. the changes that you want to make happen, That's in right. a sense. But it was such a nice surprise where they've um, had, um, um, there's an organization called Jack Patchy Foundation, mm-hmm. uh, set up by a, a gentleman that um, is a millionaire, mm-hmm. uh, Jack Patchy, about 20 years ago. And he recognizes the achievements of young people and also recognize the actual contribution of adults in the lives of the young people yeah. as well. And two of the 12 people that were part of the program got recognized wow. as well for wow. high achievers. Um, and also I was nominated and actually awarded um, what's known as a leader award within the Jack Patchy Foundation. Yeah. And it was in fact in Camden as well. Uh, they had a ceremony <laughs> okay, and fantastic. being recognized in a ceremony and all those kind of stuff. That's fantastic. 
but it was just you know, it's, it's amazing because it's just you always you always do things because you want to do them mm-hmm. because you're you know person, personally passionate about it that's right and you've always done the same thing but it's only when you actually achieve the award that others seem to recognize it yeah. it's like oh my god I want to be part of him now <laughs> but I've yeah. never changed I've always been the same person from yeah. day one yeah. but for some odd reason now just because you're an award winner mm-hmm. you somehow they want to be associated with you more yeah maybe it's a good thing because it helps you to actually get the word out there that's true But it's just, and I enabled you, know. you to, to I, when I won my awards, I found that there's a couple of things that happened. The two things that happened to me was one, I was like, wow, really? Me? <laughs> But then the second thing, as you're saying, that everyone also wants to be associated with an, with an yeah. award winner. Yeah. Um, but I think the best thing in that is that in you yourself, you then realize that you need to deliver more. It pushes clearly, you clearly. to saying that if everyone else is saying, who is this individual mm. that won an award, that pushes you in saying, so how can I better myself yeah. in order that I can better others in yeah. the years to come. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Heron, thank you so much for being here with us thank today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Just want to thank Heron so much for being with us at the Extraordinary Achievers today and to recognize that even if you were bullied as young or even if you're being bullied now or well, there's something that's not quite right in your life in any situation that you're in even if you followed a passion in something else or in the education that you've had and you're still not happy Heron is an example of saying you can find happiness you can combine everything that you've done in life and you can be happy and make others happy too thank you for watching today